So let me go ahead and kick off the webinar, folks. Um, my name is Dennis Rodriguez, and I'm the head of internal affairs for um, the uh, Siemens operations in the Western US. Hopefully everybody, everybody can hear me. I'm based here in California. So thank you for joining us uh, for another installment of the Bay Area Council's webinar series, The Bay Area Impact. In this series, we speak with business leaders, elected officials, and other experts on wide reaching effects across our global current health crisis. So today our focus is on public transit and how those systems across the planet have been faring as they adapt to the COVID-19, um, you know, just pandemic and, and everything that's been happening from a, from a COVID-19 perspective. Let me get this uh, box off of my face. <clears throat> Today, um, we're focused on uh, public transit. And you know, in the Bay Area, we've had, a, we've had a significant decrease in ridership, I think up to 80%. Uh, and this has had a devastating impact from a financial perspective as it relates to our transit systems. Um, also, as our revenue sources have kind of dried up as it relates to transit systems. So globally, However, we've had many public transit systems that are seeing ridership increase despite the global pandemic and despite uh, COVID-19. And without any uh, increase of new evidence related to COVID-19 cases related to mass transit. So today, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to talk to four uh, global experts um, based, around the, based around the world. And this is you know, such a fascinating conversation from my perspective because we've got participants from Canada, uh, China, and Japan, and obviously myself uh, based here in California to kind of talk through what the best practices uh, look like, you know, from a global perspective and, and how it relates to, how do we get the mass transit systems back on track, you know, from a, you know, really from a local perspective, but obviously looking at best practices as it relates to these different regions. So uh, with that said, please help me in welcoming Haijing Dai. So yeah. Haijing Dai is the Vice Director of the Transport Division for the Nanjing Municipal Bureau of Transportation. Haijing is responsible for the development of public transit in Nanjing, China. And Haijing, before we get to you, let me just introduce all the other um, participants. So we've also got Holly Lau. So Holly is the head of the International Development Department of the Shenzhen Bus Group, which is the largest fully electric public vehicle operator in the world. And Holly is in charge of, also in charge of international business development and corporate branding. We also have from Japan, Ryuko uh, Nakayama, who is the director of international policy of the Japan's Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transport, and Tourism. Ryuko is also responsible for developing policies concerning international affairs, in the transportation sector, including the promotion of overseas development of the Japanese transport technology. And last but not least, uh, we've got Sarah Ross, who is the director of system planning for Vancouver TransLink in Canada. So Sarah oversees a broad scope of activity, uh, including the Vancouver Transit Network, multimodal planning, and the integration of transit and land use in collaboration with uh, the various municipalities in Canada. So first off, uh, a huge thank you to all of our panelists today. I know we're kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, just um, going across the, the planet in terms of, you know, how we look to expertise in terms of all, all these countries. We're spanning multiple time zones. And I just want to say thank you, you know, if it's a uh, good evening, good afternoon, or good morning to her uh, role as a participant, we, um, you know, really appreciate it. One bit of housekeeping as we begin. I want to encourage all those in attendance to submit your questions by typing them into the question and answer uh, box, which is found at the bottom of your toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom window. So we will do our best to get to as many questions as possible. Um, and also, as you type in your questions, please also type in your company name so we know who's, who's kind of submitting what information from which company. Um, to kick things off, I'd like to ask 
all of our panelists to uh, introduce yourselves. And as you do so, please talk about how the public transit in your country and your municipality has adapted to the various changes related to COVID-19 and what, you know, what impact has that had in the last couple of months? So um, let's begin with Haijing in Nanjing, China. So Haijing. Okay, thank you for having me. And I'm going to start my introduction from the basic situation of Nanjing. Located in Yangtze River Delta, Nanjing is the capital city of Jiangsu province and an important central city in the East region. It is about 300 kilometers away from Shanghai. That is one hour by high speed railway. Nanjing has a total area of 6,587 square kilometers and a population of 8.5 million. In 2019, Nanjing's local GDP exceeded 305 billion US dollars. Facing the impact of COVID-19 epidemic early this year, Nanjing coordinated efforts in epidemic prevention and control, as well as balancing the economic and social development. So far, Nanjing recorded 93 locally transmitted cases with no patient died and no medical workers infected. Despite the disruption of the pandemic, Nanjing's GDP reached 97 billion US dollars in the first half of this year, a year-on-year -year increase of 2.2%. And for the public transit, there are 10 mansion lines in the operation with 378 kilometers, which ranking the first in China. In 2019, the daily ridership ship is around 3.50 million, accounting for 55% of the total. And for the ground transport, Nanjing has 768 bus lines with 12,000 kilometers and 8,700 buses. In the past year, the daily ridership is around 2.5 million, which accounts for 44% of the total. So you see, when talking about the pandemic influence on public transport, if you remember the data I have mentioned before, you can see that it is not strange that the COVID-19 caused a huge effect on the public transit. From January to March, the ridership of public transit shows a year-on-year -year decrease of 60%. Among that decrease, there exists the same declining trend in the daily ridership of Manchun, which is 1.24 million per day. And for the bus, there is less than 1 million per day. But unfortunately, uh, but unfortunately, with the continuous epidemic prevention and normalization of daily life, a gradual recovery of ridership began in April. So what are the specific measures for Nanjing? First, following the scientific requirements, Nanjing manages to reach the manpower and logistics reasonably and implement the strictest checking for the condition of ventilating and disinfecting of bus stations and vehicles. You see, every driver and passenger are required to take the temperature and wear the face mask before using the public transport. Furthermore, the tracking mechanism for the suspected and confirmed patients of the COVID-19 has been established. Since the February 14th, passengers are required to register by scanning the QR code, which posted on the bus and the metro carriages. Second, adjusting the service dynamically. During the pandemic prevention, the flexible service schedule has been implemented. For example, we cut some bus nights, shortened the service time, as well as reducing the departure frequency and enlarging the interval. But with the social orders recovery, especially when the work reception is fully taking place in April, the service schedule is optimized and adjusted properly according to the daily statistic analysis of ridership flow. As a result, the departure interval returns to the same level before the epidemic. And we also reopen the service during the flight time and pronounce the service time. In addition, in order to help enterprise work reception, the customized bus service is also be provided to benefit the commuting. You see, as I have mentioned before, 
that Nanjing is a city with a population of 8.5 million. But during the epidemic, Nanjing managed only 93 locally transmitted cases of COVID-19 and no fatalities. I think the secret here is not only the initiative actions of Nanjing municipal government, but also the cooperation of every Nanjing resident who think it's their responsibilities to consider for others and to work together to protect their homeland. That's all, thank you. So Nanjing, that's a, a great overview. I really appreciate it. So, uh, um, so in, instrumental in terms of how we kind of set the table for what's happening from this perspective. So the next um, person we'll kind of turn to is Holly Lau, uh, who I mentioned is the head of the Shenzhen group, bus group. So Holly, um, any updates in terms of uh, your opening statements in terms of how everything is happening in Shenzhen from a bus perspective? Um, hi, everyone. Well, am I able to share my screen? I'll show people a bit of a chart of, you know, how the ridership has declined and some of the methods that we have taken um, on my slide. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Hallie. Um, as Dennis introduced, um, so for those of you that don't know, uh, Shenzhen is uh, one of the biggest city in China and located in the southern border, uh, bordering Hong Kong. And um, it's sort of the Silicon Valley in Asia with um, tech companies uh, such as Tencent, Huawei, uh, BYD, etc. headquartered here. So um, actually, as Ten uh, Dennis mentioned, that we are the largest uh, all electric vehicle uh, public transportation operator in the world with, um, and we run around 6,000 electric buses and 5,000 electric taxis. So all of the fleet in Shenzhen public transportation are electric. And um, that's a bit of related on, you know, how we manage throughout the pandemic um, in a bit, uh, which I'll, I'll go in a bit uh, in detail. So just to give everyone a bit of a background on what's happening on the ground here. Uh, so we actually went into lockdown in January. And um, so uh, luckily so far, um, because uh, China went into a pretty aggressive lo uh, nationwide lockdown um, from January to March, and um, completely blocked off transportation uh, from Wuhan at the time. So what, uh, what happened was that most of the cases that were discovered were mostly in Wuhan and cities like you know, Shenzhen, Shanghai, Beijing, and, and even Nanjing, like my, co my colleague said, um, luckily that we've only had a few hundred cases up till now, and we haven't seen a locally transmitted cases since uh, I think 150 days ago so we have all went back to work since uh mid-march and now i would say most things have been uh going back to normal it, even bars and clubs etc all of that has been has opened in, in the past few months so um how, however i think everyone is wearing masks and and that uh all of the uh, social distancing and um, public uh, sanitization, all of those methods have, will still last, I think, for at least the next uh, coming six months to a year and beyond. So I'll talk a little bit about that later. And um, as we've seen all across the world as well, um, ridership has been decreasing significantly. This is the latest stats in August, however, in January, um, our bus ridership, taxi ridership has dropped down to uh, more than 90% uh, because of the lockdown and also people were not um, uh, taking public transportation. However, similar to Wuhan, which was the epicenter of the outbreak in China, um, we actually use a lot of our vehicles, including the taxis and buses for um, emergency responses and essential service provide, uh, providing. So we were transferring goods, uh, medical goods, and also um, healthcare professionals as well. So we still kept uh, around 20% um, of our lines running. However, um, we did cap 
uh, kept all of our bus capacity at only 50%. And um, that was only slowly uh, changed, uh, I think, in April and, and May. So now we're seeing the ridership. Um, you can see it from here, the attack, uh, metro and bus ridership going back slowly to uh, where it was in 2019 at uh, about 90%. However, I would say during peak time, uh, it's it's definitely more than 100% uh, since uh, all business activities are back to normal. So sort of the um, progression uh, is from the metro company in, in Shenzhen. And um, so what we did in January, uh, so actually it coincided, the outbreak coincided with Chinese New Year and um, luckily, but unluckily, so all of our staff were actually um, on vacation. Uh, so we were able to stop a lot of the non-essential uh, non essential travels and services since everyone was already with their family at home. So what we did was we uh, immediately did a emergency procurement process uh, that included uh, sanitizers, masks, um, all of the good, goods for our um, bus drivers and staff since we have more than 30,000 staff. So um, it, it's essential that they feel protected while, while on the job and that um, when passengers come, come on the bus that they see that we take uh, these safety measures very seriously. So they feel safe to take public transportation. So. Um, uh, while on the job, uh, wearing, wearing masks is mandatory, and um, we've installed uh, all sanitizers and um, disinfectants all throughout uh, our buses and depots, and um, each bus is required to disinfect after each service trip, and um, we've also implemented uh, social distancing me measures in all 13 of our canteens. Um, and even up, even till now, we still have to sit apart uh, six meters with, uh, with our colleagues and um, all of the table is arranged by uh, one person seating. So uh, no more socializing at lunch, uh, but uh, these are still quite uh, strictly enforced, I think for uh, up till the foreseeable future. And um, a lot of our buses were also uh, um, being used for emergency evacuation plans uh, for uh, ports and al also border uh, pickups, especially when there were cruise ships that were docking. Um, so since uh, all our staff have all these PPE and, and um, were trained, so I, I think um, we um, most of the time we were given 24 hours, less than 24 hours notice and um, we would help the government to, trans uh, to transfer these passengers from uh, ports to uh, said quarantine hotels, etc. Yep, and I think, um, oh, I, I think one of the most important thing is uh, the QR, we get asked a lot about the QR code system, about tracking and tracing. So we, uh, similarly to, I think most of the most of the other cities in China, uh, since QR code, WeChat, Alibaba, uh, Alipay, all these apps are very widely used in China. I would say e-payment is around 99%. Um, uh, and uh, we actually installed a QR code system uh, on board, on bus, uh, also on Metro as well, that uh, whenever a passenger enters uh, a bus that they scan this code right here and um, it's voluntary, but we tell them it's for their own safety that um, they should put down their name and phone number just in case if there is um, any passenger on board that has contracted uh, COVID that we would be able to uh, notify them immediately. So um, it's, a, it's a widely used practice in, in China, whether it's on public transportation or airplanes or whenever you enter a building. So um, yeah, and, and this helps us to, to track um, sort of the movement, et cetera. And this is only shared, uh, the data is only shared with uh, the healthcare bureau and, and the police if there are cases needed. 
So luckily, uh, so far we haven't had any case uh, where on board we've discovered passengers that have uh, contracted COVID. Um, and we also moved all of our training courses online. So during the pandemic, uh, most of our technical guide for our drivers, maintenance staffs on how to maintain uh, social distancing, uh, driving safety methods, all of these uh, training courses, we have moved them to an app uh, training system. So all our staff that are, including the ones that were at the time trapped in Wuhan and not be able to travel back to Shenzhen, um, they were able to take these uh, courses um, and uh, guides at home. Uh, so we can avoid these uh, mass gatherings of trainings. Uh, including these notifications for passengers as well. Uh, the last I would mention is that for our taxi services, because um, the bus service is largely, uh, especially the ticket side is largely subsidized by uh, the government, but the taxis, all 6, 000, uh, 5,000 of them are mostly commercially run. So we saw um, all the revenues drops being most impacted by COVID because it was uh, nighttime activities where people would probably take more taxis. So um, we've launched uh, uh, different services, including um, uh, we partner with the delivery company called SF, which is a, one of the biggest logistics company in China, where we uh, sort of like an Uber Eats situation where we would use our cars to deliver goods. And um, a uh, Pass a pickup service for school children because um, our taxis have six cameras on board and um, we use that to uh, pick up school children who are not uh, where the parents are not comfortable with them taking public transportations for uh, during COVID or um, as we are in this recovery phase right now. And uh, yeah. Um, I, I will also talk, I can also talk a bit more in the Q&A, but I think I'm a bit out of questions. Um, lot, yeah. So Holly, thank you very much. That, that's, um, that's an incredible presentation. We really appreciate it. That's um, very comprehensive from what's happening in, in your uh, neck of the woods, as you say. Um, so let's skip a beat and go to Ryuko in Japan. And Ryuko, do you have, um, I don't know if you have any slides, but can you walk us through your... I don't have any visual slides, so okay. I will talk, okay. Okay, so how, hello every, uh, everyone. Uh, so uh, today I'm talking uh, from Tokyo, Japan. We are still in the morning, early in the morning. And uh, so as uh, Dennis introduced, uh, I am uh, responsible for international affairs in the ministry. So normally I'm supposed to make business trips frequently uh, around the globe, including the US. Uh, but this year, uh, the, the pandemic has not allowed me to do so. So since uh, February, actually, my last business trip uh, was uh, to the U.S. in February. So therefore, it seems even more precious uh, to me uh, to have an opportunity to share what's going on in each, each country and exchange views with how other countries are dealing with such unprecedented matters in the transportation sector. So therefore, I'd like to thank you very much for inviting me to this this web webinar today. So now let me talk about uh, what has uh, been happening to the public transportation in Japan uh, since the outbreak of the pandemic. So I'm uh, working for the national government. So I, I will talk, I will cover uh, the overall, uh, the situation of overall the situation of Japan. And also I'm living and staying in Tokyo. So maybe my uh, experience is based in Tokyo. Okay. so. The government of Japan uh, declared a state of emergency in response to the pandemic in early April. Uh, however, it did not intend to close cities or implement a so-called lockdown as taken place in other countries. So instead, the government requested people to voluntarily refrain from traveling a long distance or going out for non-essential purposes under the current framework defined by Japanese law. Uh, as a result, the ridership of railway transportation significantly declined during the emergency period. For example, the number of passengers at major railway stations in Tokyo, for example, has dropped by 70%. Uh, 
uh, while the ridership of bus services once dropped by 50%. So during such, uh, most, such a most sluggish period, uh, the number of urban and local rail services were basically maintained, however, at the usual level, mainly for two reasons. Uh, first reason come from the cost structure of railway companies. Uh, it was considered that even if they temporarily reduced uh, train services, it would not greatly help them in saving costs. Because uh, why? Because the ratio of, of the fixed costs, uh, such as rail maintenance and train maintenance costs, are relatively high. So second reason is uh, somewhat related to the pan pandemic itself. Uh, the railway companies consider it better to maintain the existing service uh, existing services or capacity uh, to, to secure enough spaces between passengers. After the outbreak of COVID-19. Uh, people started to worry about getting infected inside the, inside the crowded trains. So since the emergency declaration was lifted in late May, and then schools and restaurants and shops reopened, uh, the, uh, the ridership has gradually been recovering. For example, in the case of railway, the ridership has recovered to 70% of last year. And in the case of bus services, about 80% level now. Furthermore, as an effort to restore the confidence of passengers in using the public transportation and then facilitate further recovery of the ridership, uh, some transportation companies have launched an initiative to share a real-time congestion status inside the trains and the cars or with smartphone application. So, and our, minister, our ministry are supporting such efforts uh, by creating guidelines for such information sharing, so this is so this is just overview what's what uh, what has been uh, happening and uh, the current situation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reiko. Really appreciate your uh, input. So let's um, pivot. Um, last but not least, to Sarah Ross in Vancouver. So Sarah, um, any input to mention towards? the basic question of what's happening in your transit system from a COVID perspective? Yeah, for sure. So uh, thank you so much for including me. I'm Sarah Ross, I'm the Director of System Planning at TransLink in Metro Vancouver, that's in British Columbia. We are on the West Coast, just a couple of hours north of Seattle. TransLink is both the regional transportation authority uh, with a mandate over major roads, some bridges and active transportation. And we're also the transit agency. We have an integrated transit system and we're responsible for our bus network, rapid transit, commuter rail, paratransit, passenger ferries. Uh, I know folks in the Bay Area will be interested uh, to know that we have an integrated fare system. So no matter what part of the transit system you are using, uh, you can tap your compass card. Our region uh, has a population of about two and a half million. Um, this puts us as about the 24th largest city across Canada and the US. But I always like to say we punch way above our weight when it, in terms of transit ridership. You know, Pre-COVID, we were moving 400 million boardings a year, some 900,000 a day. And this puts us well into the top 10 of cities in Canada and the US in terms of uh, transit ridership. You know, uh, before the pandemic hit, our region was on a huge ridership growth curve. Uh, from 2017 to 2019, our ridership increased 17%. Uh, so, you know, we were we were in the start uh, starting our fourth year of the largest transit expansion program this region has seen, increasing bus service across the region, rolling more more out more uh, trains on our rapid transit network, extending that uh, network. We're a transit-oriented region. Uh, we have long-standing land use policy that focuses development in centers and along transit corridors. This is a perfect, no, no, it's not perfect. Sure, we still have auto-oriented areas too. Uh, but there isn't really, and there's almost nowhere in the region that you can't get to on transit and transit is widely used by people across all demographics. And, you know, in terms of context of COVID, while our low COVID numbers are not as impressive as, um, my, as some of my colleagues on this panel, overall British Columbia, which has a population of 5 million, have kept cases low, uh, particularly given that, you know, we are an international hub city. Our total cases have been around 
8,500 and, and deaths that uh, have been kept to 230. Um, we are monitoring this closely because we're actually, our, our new cases a day, which are, are around fluctuating around 100, are actually at their highest point than they've been uh, in the last six months. For us, the pandemic you know, really arrived here in mid-March um, and the activity of the region ground to a halt and our ridership fell off a cliff uh, and we were launched into a very serious financial situation. One of TransLink's strengths has been our high reliance on user fees. Fares are our single, single largest source of revenue, um, covering about 55% of our transit operating costs, which is one of the highest cost recoveries uh, in the country. We also rely on parking sales tax, uh, fuel tax, uh, and all of those revenues kind of evaporated like overnight. Um, but you know, with the support of uh, senior governments, we've been able to avoid service cuts and avoid layoffs. And today we are running essentially 100% of our, our service. I'd say right away, we focused on changes that would help our customers be and feel safe. So we developed a, a safe operating action plan. <clears throat> Excuse me, you'll notice that shortens to SOAP. Excuse me, uh, that... <clears throat> That included things like <clears throat> dramatic cleaning, barriers for bus operators, queuing systems in place, decals with loading guidelines. We have a mandatory mask policy. We've put in place new targets for passenger loads, and we've been reallocating bus service to increase service on corridors where ridership is the most robust so that those trips aren't crowded. Our economy started to open up in mid-May. And now all sectors of the economy are back open, including schools, although university students and office workers are still largely working remotely. Our ridership is now at about 40% of our, our pre-COVID ridership. Um, and you know, we're now uh, shifting into significant marketing effort, efforts to reach out to our customers, to engage with them, uh, to help them understand what we have in the in the system. And also, you know, we have a tradition in TransLink and in our region of trying to have fun with our customers. We recently issued a special compass card, which is our fair media, you know, with quotes, quotes, uh, the, the a phrase of our chief medical officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry, who's, whose um, leadership has been um, paramount and she's become somewhat of a celebrity. And, and that compass card says, be kind, be calm, be safe. So that's where we're at. Well, I, I definitely appreciate the be kind, be calm, be safe, because I think that's a take on the British, um, you know, uh, uh, monarchy of, of, you know, be calm and carry on, you know, if you will. So very, very much a, a, a saw worth of what's happening from a English perspective. So let me, let me ask the panel this question. So we've talked a little bit about um, uh, QR testing and just, uh, COVID-19 testing, and I want to ask each of you, you know, what's happening in your individual perspectives from um, a contact uh, uh, tracing perspective. So contact tracing is obviously, obviously something that has impacted all of us to a healthy degree. Um, but what does that mean from your perspective? So Sarah, let's, let's start with you just because you're the freshest panelists here. So what, what does that mean from your perspective? What, what's happening from a contact tracing perspective? Uh, so in British Columbia, contract tracing is, is, is undertaken by the public health authority. I think one of the strengths we've had in our, in our province is that we have had very strong public health uh, and they've been very on top of contract tracing. Um, and they have not deployed any type of top technology in British Columbia to assist with that. They work uh, you know, I think a lot of it is calling up the people when you have a positive COVID taste, test, talking to them, getting the context. There are protocols now in place around leaving your contact information if you're at a restaurant, for example, but we don't have um, a widespread uh, technology app, for example, that we're using um, actively in British Columbia. And, you know, we're not aware of any cases of transmission on our transit system, um, I'll also mention. Okay. So Haijing, is this, is this um, the contact tracing, is that something you guys have been active with? And if so, does that translate to Holly in, in terms of her experience in Shenzhen? But what, what's happening from a contract tracing perspective um, within Beijing? Okay, 
uh, in Nanjing, we use the passive QR code application to do the contact tracing. And you see the this QR code application is developed by the third parties. Uh, by third parties and it is only, you say, used used for the used for the uh, sorry, uh, it's used uh, only used for the pandemic prevention and control. And you see passengers are encouraged to scan the QR codes when boarding the public transit. And it's uh, optional instead of uh, compulsive measures, uh, which means that the aim is to prevent the spread of COVID-19 as well as to pre protect our passengers. And if your uh, passengers choose to scan the codes, they can also know the time, the number of the bus or train they are taking. And they can also provide the contact numbers through this application so that we can contact them if there were any suspected or confirmed cases of COVID-19 on the same bus or train. You see, actually, it's very, it's very effective and helpful in supporting us to, to do the contact tracing. And I think there is also a very important point here you need to, you need to know that with the high-speed development in China, the mobile internet applications have become one part of everyday life in China. And people are very used to scanning the codes to pay, to take the bus or train, to order the takeout, and so on. And during the pandemic, people are very cooperative and supportive because they know it's a kind of protect, protections to himself, to his family, to his friends, as well as to the whole society. Thank you. Thank you, Anjing. Um, Holly, any response from your side in terms of what's happening from a, um, from a QR perspective and a contact tracing perspective? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's uh, pretty much the same situation with my colleague uh, Haixing in, in Nanjing. So um, people have been very cooperative. Um, and even when they um, uh, board the bus and if uh, people are not wearing masks, et cetera, uh, our drivers would provide assistance. They would give them a, a free mask and also guide them through the QR code system. However, um, it's uh, something that Chinese people do uh, with the system, uh, QR code, WeChat uh, every day. So I think it's a bit of a, you know, there, there's no adapt, uh, any adapting that they would need. So uh, yeah, I, I think it's been hugely uh, useful. Thank you. Raiko, any input from your side? Uh, yes, uh, in Japan, uh, we do not have uh, like tracing system specific to the transportation system. Uh, but uh, the, our national government uh, provided a kind of a, a smartphone application called uh, COCOA, a contact confirmation application uh, system, COCOA. So this system uh, gives you a notice when you have spent more than 15 minutes uh, close to those who are tested positive. So in anywhere, not only in the transportation uh, system. And so when you receive such a notice, you will, uh, you will also be given information about uh, where and how to take PCR test. So this application was developed taking the privacy issues uh, fully into consideration. So COCO application will never share the info about uh, who was tested positive or who received a notice uh, with anybody else and or no accumulate in the computer server of the government. So just let you know, so you are, you are uh, with you, somebody who uh, tested positive. Okay. Thank you, Raiko. So um, let, me, um, let me switch to audience questions at this point. So we've got a, a question from Jim Gonzalez to all panelists, is disinfecting of your rail cars and buses being done by the people or automated systems. So, Raiku, let me uh, start with you. Is that is that a question you can answer in terms of is it happening from a robotic perspective or a personal perspective or what's what's happening from a dis disinfectant perspective? Does that make sense? Raiku. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, yes, yes. 
So um, are your buses and trains being disinfected by people or uh, robotics or what's what's the uh, what's the activity to disinfect the transit system? So you mean after after the train was found that it was infected, you mean? Uh, it's just um, have any of the train systems um, been disinfected? Are they disinfected from transit, from mm -hmm. uh, robotics, or from uh, individuals working on the train systems? Or what's what's the process to disinfect this transit system? Oh, um, I don't. I I'm not very really sure, but I I. I, I don't think that there is a special like robotics to uh, to the infect due to the disinfect. So no, basically the men workers uh, do that do the work, the job. I think. Okay. Anybody from China, um, Haijing or Holly? Um, so our actually all our staff do the disinfections uh, in the cleaning service. Uh, so all of that is done after each service trip. And um, so far we've still been using the traditional, just the 70% uh, alcohol disinfectants, but we are also testing with the nano technology one where the ones where you spray and uh, it has a cloak on the bus. Uh, it stays for around three to four months and uh, it's a less frequency, uh, a bit more pricey, but uh, yeah, so we're still experiencing some of these uh, other disinfectant methods because we think even for the next uh, a year to two, we would still need to remain these practices in, in place as long as uh, the COVID situation still lingers. Yeah. Hi, Jing. Uh, I think the same as Shenzhen. And uh, you see, we need to provide the extra people and uh, extra logistics on the cleaning, on the disinfecting. And you see, it's a very huge investment mm -hmm. as now as the you see the COVID nineteen because you don't know why it ends. That's all. Sarah, any input from your side? Yeah, I mean, our, all of our cleaning is done by our uh, by people by our staff. One of the things we and we have increased cleaning protocols, including we now have sort of a pit crew of people that go out and clean, particularly on our rail system, those high touch points uh, throughout the day, which is not a practice we had had before. The, the cleaning had all been done uh, when vehicles were out of service. Uh, so that's uh, something that we've changed through this time. So uh, we've got another question here from Vince from Solano Transportation Authority. Um, how are transit agencies balancing the need to increase ridership uh, with the need to reduce onboard capacity to to go ahead of the social distancing social distancing protocol? So, anybody has any input on this? Um, Sarah, do you want to offer? Yeah, your sure. Point? I'm happy to speak to that. That's something yeah. that I've been most directly involved in my role. Uh, you know, for all of our services, we have loading guidelines. We plan our service uh, provision based on those guidelines. We went through a process to review those guidelines, reduce them. We moved right. One of the first things we did, pretty, it, it probably by the end of March, was actually uh, dramatically reduce the the numbers of people allowed on vehicles down from. Uh, to only half of a seated load. Uh, then by uh, early June, we then increased that. Uh, and now our, our um, guidelines are to have about two thirds of what we would typically have. We had a very, very crowded system before. As I said, our ridership was growing 17%. We've been rolling out expansion, but we haven't been able to keep up. So we had a crowding all over our system. So with these new guidelines, we monitor the ridership really closely using uh, a variety, you know, our compass card data, our automated passenger counts, and we've been doing reallocations. So we've been reallocating service from places where the ridership, you know, we've had, we have more service to places where the ridership has perhaps stayed more robust uh, so that we can get more trips out there so that we can ensure that people um, aren't being crowded on the system uh, and also aren't being left behind uh, on this on the uh, sidewalk so overall uh, combined you know 
it's it's mass transit. We we can't have uh, people are not going to be able to achieve two meters of distance at every part of their transit trip. Probably for some parts and some locations they can. And so with mandatory masks, uh, that's been really part of that as well. And trying to deploy this service to avoid crowding. So let me uh, throw a wild card in here. Um, so a question from Jim Spearing. Do they have any uh, transit managers that oversee all the transit operations for your respective focus points? So um, Sarah, is that is that a question you can kind of respond to? Do, do you have a transit manager that oversees the transit operations related to Vancouver and you know, yeah. likewise for the different operations uh, around the country? Um, well, in our system, you know, we have a number, it's an integrated system, but it's delivered by a number of different organizations. Each one of those has manager of operations or director of operations in the, in the structure. And so, you know, I think the thing about um, uh, this pandemic and something that, you know, I've seen in our industry is, you know, people rise to the challenge of a crisis like this. And so this has been a response that has involved people from across our organization, everybody from the supervisors out on the ground to the people working in the depots, to the people in the corporate head office who are doing the planning work, who are engaging with the provincial governments. I mean, it's been all hands on deck uh, to do the best that we can for our customers given the situation we're in. So let me ask you another question here from Kirk Kluke. Uh, Kirk um, asked, is China, Japan, or Canada looking to also invest in rail infrastructure to stimulate their economies? So um, Haijing, is that, is that something you can respond to? Is, is, <clears throat> is the rail economy look um, something you guys are looking to invest, to, invest into uh, per your transportation network at this point? Yeah, as for Nanjing, you see, based on the construction of transit uh, metro parties, uh, the funding of the public transport is provided by the local revenue. And we also, you see, invest uh, a huge, a huge money on the, uh, on the instrument uh, of the public transport. Yeah, that's all. And Holly? Same question. Um, yeah, so similarly, I, I think China has invested a significant amount into in the rail infrastructure and, and the system within the country. Um, and I would also add that um, that both uh, the, munis uh, the munis regional government and central government has uh, really rolled out mandate to invest in clean energy transportation, uh, Shenzhen being one of the uh, uh, a case and um, also uh, I've recently uh, went on to test write the SkyRail uh, system that was actually just rolled out by BYD uh, within, uh, within their headquarters. So it's, it's a light rail system that they're building uh, around 40 to 50 meters uh, above the road. So that is also in planning for uh, microcirculation services uh, within airports, uh, residential areas, uh, and uh, so, so that's to uh, deal with the traffic congestions in major cities in China. So yeah, I think um, China would continually uh, invest uh, in a lot of the uh, in infrastructure. And Raiku, how about Japan? Oh, yes. Uh, so actually in Japan, uh, Basically, uh, we do we do not have plan to to uh, to to make a big investment for infrastructure in order to stim stimulate uh, economy, uh, but rather so so I would like to mention that uh, in Japan most of the tra transportation companies uh, operated as uh, private companies and financially independent in independent from the local or national government. So so what we have to do now is to to help them to survive. Uh, the current very hard situation and also uh, so so that's why we have provided them uh, like some financial assistance to 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 support their liquidity or also to to maintain the employment and moreover uh, our government has just uh, launched a 12 billion dollar stimulus package uh, called go to campaign uh, to restore domestic tourism 
And uh, so actually, at, at, at this moment, uh, Tokyo is excluded because uh, there are there, there have been a lot of uh, tested people. So, but uh, from next month, uh, we will start to include uh, Tokyo uh, into this uh, big uh, uh, tourism uh, stimulus uh, campaign. So we hope that, uh, so, so basically it, it will be a long distance uh, operators which will be, be uh, directly benefited from this campaign. Uh, but, it, but it is also expected to contribute to stimulating transportation demand within, within the region or within city by, pro by promoting the travel between city. Thank you. Thank you, Raiko. So um, let me ask a follow-up question here from Chris from AC Transit. So do any of the panelists believe that transit ridership will return to pre-COVID levels um, within their regions? So Raiku, let me let me start with you. Do you do you think that there's any anticipation that um, uh, ridership levels will return to pre-COVID levels uh, in Tokyo or other parts of Japan at any point in the future? Uh, yes. Uh, so actually, as I mentioned uh, in my opening uh, remark, uh, the 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 level is recovering to like uh, around uh, seventy eight percent now. But actually, uh, there are still many companies uh, where uh, which uh, ask their employees to uh, to work from home, and also uh, we are more and more accustomed to having meetings, the conference online uh, like this. So, and also some universities have still providing a lot of lectures as online style. So, if they decide to come back to like this company and uh, campus. So we could increase the level of the, uh, the uh, ridership, uh, like more like 80% or maybe 90%. But actually, uh, after the, this pandemic, uh, people started to, uh, started to think about changing their lifestyle and work style. So, um, so we, at this moment, I'm not really sure that the ridership will be coming back just 100%. So in that case, um, so railway companies or bus companies or even the government uh, policymakers, uh, we have to think about uh, transportation policy or the uh, company strategy. So Sarah, let me ask you the same question. Do you, I mean, do you think um, ridership will return to pre-COVID levels at any point or what, what's your general thoughts on that? Uh, the, the short answer is yes. The little bit of a longer answer is, as it happens, we have been engaged in our Transport 2050, uh, uh, which is an update to our long range strategy that's been going on for the last you know, year or so. And so we've been trying to keep that work going. And we've been having a lot of com that very question and, and put a lot of thought into it. And our, our sense is that, yes, over time we will return to that because the fundamentals of our region are still here and you know there's still a geography challenge uh, and you know uh, transit is the most efficient way to to move uh, people uh, now it's not going to happen in 2021 and probably not in 2022 it might even make, take us a decade so I think it is going to take a long time uh, but we do feel confident that over time we will get there uh, because the region and, and the city is resilient to that and will recover. Great answer. Holly and Haijing, um, same question. Do you, is there any, you know, kind of big, big ticket impact from the COVID-19 that you think um, is worth mentioning here? And then um, once you guys answer that, I, I've got a, I think we've got a final uh, post question here. We've got about five minutes left. So Holly and um, Ajin, let me turn it over to you real quick and then we'll go to the final question. Yeah, um, 100%. I, I think we are monitoring all of our uh, ridership going back to around 90% uh, level uh, compared to 2019. So I think um, as we keep uh, communicating to passengers that um, we're doing, uh, we're still keeping the stringent disinfectants and cleaning. Uh, services in place where uh, ridership confidence goes up um, and all activities goes back to normal here I, I think we would see it go up to 100% uh, pretty soon so so I think um, there, there will be light at the end of the tunnel hopefully Hi Jane. Um, and I think for Nanjing the answer is yes 
definitely, because this is what is happening now in Nanjing. You see with the normalization of the daily life and the, you see the work reception, uh, we can see people uh, returning to the public transport. And uh, I think, uh, except that if um, people are used to the online working, I think uh, the answer is yes. Yeah. Good. So um, let me ask the panel uh, a final wrap up question here. And this is um, a great question from um, one of our good friends with the Bear Council who is, happens to be the chief of staff for the Bear Council. So his question is, what is the biggest mistake we made in response to COVID-19? And what did we learn from that? So it's a, it's a great question. It kind of involves self-reflection and, and that sort of thing. So Sarah, let me, um, let me start with you. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but let me, let me start with you and just ask you, in the COVID-19 era, which um, is a, a difficult era to, to begin with, what, you know, from your perspective, from a trans transportation perspective, what's what's the biggest challenge we've we've had in Vancouver and what's the biggest mistake, you know, you think um, has taken place, not specific to your department or your <laughs> your job, but just, you know, what 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 would you change from this point forward? Uh, that's a that's a great question. I'm sorry, I don't have like a, a, a really snappy answer off that because it's really thought provoking. Um, you know, I, I think we've done, I've been so proud to be a British Columbian through this time, I, ha I have to, to say. Um, and I think we've done so many things and it's gone uh, really well. Um, you know, we've had uh, the, the been interesting to see the, the dialogue around masks evolve. Uh, certainly, we look to our um, our peers in Asia, uh, who are been very uh, uh, adopting of masks very very early on. My my husband talks about coming off a flight from uh, into the airport sometime in February, and a flight had landed from China. And he's like, every single person was wearing a mask, and that's one of our moments, our COVID moments of like, wow, this is serious. And and so we started promoting masks. Um, our health authorities hadn't done a heavy push on masks, and that's changed uh, um, over over the months. And and now there's a much much heavier push on masks and um, a, a mandatory requirement in in on the transit system and in many other places. So I don't know if I'd go as far to say it was a mistake not to do it earlier, but I have noticed, uh, you know, and I hear numbers coming out of my my colleagues, and I think, wow, you know, clearly uh, that that's there's some you know something for us to think about. Great, great response. So Sarah, thank you so much. Um, Raiko, same question. Um, if you had to look at the total response to COVID-19 from a Japanese transportation perspective, what's what is the biggest thing you guys would change? Is there any mistakes? Is there anything that you would alter? What you know? What basically makes sense to kind of change at this point? Okay, so so actually, so it's <laughs> it's difficult to say what what's the biggest mistake. And but but actually uh, this uh, the pandemic was very much uh, unprecedented and unexpected, and so maybe people at first time maybe people uh, have uh, under underestimated the seriousness I guess I think and also myself, and uh, so there are a lot of trial and errors both for, uh, among people and both uh, both in the government, uh, but. Uh, Maybe so. What uh, we have learned uh, from uh, this uh, pandemic is actually in Japan the population is rapidly aging in general and starting to decrease, especially in rural areas. So actually, we we are now in the time uh, to think about seriously think about what we have to do to uh, to uh, to make the transport system, trans public transportation system, uh, sustainable, uh, even if the demand is uh, declining. So actually, we, uh, we, we have been thinking about taking advantage of new technologies at su uh, such as mass ma mobility as a service uh, to make the public transportation mode, mode more convenient, as well as autonomous vehicles to address the shortage drivers, but which will uh, help to uh, like, uh, amount uh, very, uh, to, to, uh, to reduce the uh, contact between people. Uh, 
So, but so that so I can say that pandemic has forced us to accelerate such initiatives. So, so maybe this is the most uh, biggest uh, takeaways or uh, lessons uh, we we have learned. I think so. We have to accelerate the next action. Yeah, great answer, Raiko. Thank you so much. So um, we only have a, a minute left. Uh, let's pivot to China. So. Hi Jing and uh, Holly, let's um, let's let's get your take on this question too. Hi Jing, let's start with you. Any, um, okay. any specific okay. um, mistake or or correction you would make in this pandemic? Uh, I think I will answer this question in the perspective of uh, challenge. Uh, I think the first challenge is that uh, you need a huge investment. Uh, that means that you see it's a long-term impact on the cost and the efficiency of the public transport. You need extra people, extra money to do all the, you say the ventilating, the disinfecting I mentioned before. And the second one is uh, that we need to improve the, uh, improving the, the, our the security checking, you see, for example, take the Xinjiakou Metro Station, for example, there is 24 entries. And if you need to do the broadening temperature testing, you need you need to, you say, to, to use some, uh, for example, uh, similar infrared temperature detection system. You see, next, next this one. So you can do the, uh, you can enable the convenient pass during the peak time. And the second is that the third one is that uh, we need to optimize the dynamic dispatch, dispatching mechanism so we can, you see, to um, adjust our service time, for example. And uh, I think uh, the last one is that you need to encourage people to notice that uh, it's their responsibilities to do their to take actions to show their consideration for others. I think this is very important. Thank you. Yeah. Holly, any last words? Uh, yeah, well, I, I think looking back, um, any country, especially China, I, I think none of us know the severity uh, of this pandemic and how it would have evolved. And I think back in January, um, we, we, I think everyone wished they, that they acted faster, even though I, I think we've, uh, especially in China's case, I think we've acted uh, really swiftly and uh, we were able to assemble a, an emergency response team within seven days. And we had a intelligent dispatching center where we were monitoring 24 seven. And um, also second to Rieko's point, I, I think now, uh, all the transit agencies are seeing such an urgency to pivot to more on-demand services, more dynamic um, uh, services that have to cater to not just the mass public, but also uh, to specific uh, uh, customized uh, routes as well. We're seeing more uh, demand for smaller buses, more flexible routes, and I think that's going to be the future as well. And uh, also with, I think, the aging population, uh, not only in Japan, but in China and Asia in general, I think we also need to think about how, especially in such a tech savvy population, the young population in China, how do we include more of the senior population when they get on board uh, with payments and uh, QR code tracking, all of these uh, we cannot um, exclude. Uh, there's such a mass population here. So yeah, I, I think just to summarize everyone's point, um, I think, yeah, they've perfectly uh, spoke my mind. Thanks, Ali. So um, I think we're about four minutes over schedule, so I'd like to go ahead and close, uh, close the contact at this point. Um, great, you know, great conversation, great panelists, great um, bear council input, great participants from the audience. And I'd just like to say thank you and just kind of go ahead and close this out at this point. You're all free to go about the rest of your day, whether it's evening, afternoon, or morning. Um, but thank you, thank you, thank you from our perspective, and we appreciate your input. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Happy to participate. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for having us.